very warm welcome home to the Chicago area. Thank you. It's wonderful to be here, both for uh, this uh, occasion, but to be back in Chicago on a beautiful May afternoon. <laughs> Being here tonight has made me think a lot about my grandmother, who we just spoke about, and also about my mother, who spent the time that I was preparing for this interview watching my daughter. Um, so I wanted to start off by asking you about being a grandmother, which I know is so important to you. How is it different than being a mother? And is it better or worse? <laughs> well, this is a question that, um, no matter how you answer it, <laughs> It has problematic <laughs> implications, but I'll just forge right ahead. Um, it is incredible. I have three grandchildren. I have an eight-year-old granddaughter, a six-year-old grandson, and a three-year-old grandson. And I'm very lucky because Chelsea and her husband Mark and uh, these three incredible little kids uh, live in New York City, and Bill and I live about 50 minutes north of the city. So we're in and out all the time. They're out to see us. The only good thing about COVID is that they came and lived with us for uh, 18 months, which was just the greatest gift. Um, so it's very different. I mean, it really is, as friends of mine told me for years, uh, the one experience in life that is not overrated, uh, because you are so overwhelmed in seeing your child um, become a parent and then being introduced to uh, these new little people. Uh, but it's also an incredible um, sense of responsibility, not the kind of responsibility you had, I had as a mother where you know, I had to worry about the pedi pediatrician appointments and the school conferences and all of that. But it's this sense of responsibility about what is the world going to be like for these um, kids when they get older and what, what do I need to do even as a grandparent to try to, you know, make sure that uh, the country and the world that they uh, grow up into uh, is um, you know filled with possibility and hopefulness, and that's a big challenge today. So I'm glad you took us there because that was just what I was going to ask next. Um, how are you feeling about this world for your grandchildren? I mean, there's a lot of scary stuff happening in the world right now, and it's very hard for a lot of people to remain optimistic. So I'm curious for how you, for your balance on that. How do you maintain optimism when there's so much at stake? Well, I'll start with a story, Charlotte, because it really is something I think about a lot. Um, my wonderful late friend and uh, predecessor as Secretary of State, Madeline Albright, who <laughs> was just an extraordinary person, uh, you know, first her family had to escape from the Nazis and then they go back to what was then Czechoslovakia and they have to escape from, you know, the Soviet Union uh, communists and I mean she just led a very impactful, meaningful life and then uh, became uh, our first woman Secretary of State and was just an extraordinary uh, representative of our uh, country. and. She wrote some very powerful books, um, including a book on, about fascism shortly before she died. And when she would go on her book tour, events like this, talking, and people like you would be asking her questions, and she would talk about the serious challenges that we know we face in the world, uh, some of which we can barely understand, like the impact of artificial intelligence or what you know, rapid changes in climate will actually do uh, to all of uh, us in the future. So at the end, oftentimes, the interviewer, maybe uh, an audience member, would say, well, you know, we've talked about all these serious issues, and I have to ask you, are you an optimist or a pessimist about the future? And I love, love, love her answer, because here's what she said. She said, well, you know, I remain an optimist 
but an optimist who worries a lot. <laughs> And that's exactly how I feel uh, these days. I mean, I feel, you know, optimistic. You can't help but feel positive about so many good things that are happening. And, and as we said earlier, as a grandparent, watching these, you know, grandchildren discover the world. But yeah, I do worry a lot. So when people say to me, how are you? I say, personally, I'm fine. But, you know, I worry a lot about our country and the world. Yeah, so on that note, Trump's back. <laughs> what do you think you learned from running against him and obviously closely, closely watching 2020? What works against him and what doesn't work against him? You know, look, he um, apparently intends to run for president again. Um, despite being indicted now at least once, and there may be more to come. Um, and he has a hardcore following, because you have to think of him not as a former president or even as a presidential candidate, so much as a cult leader. Yeah. He has a... He has a hold on a, you know, significant percentage of the Republican Party um, who view him with all of his demagoguery and his authoritarian tendencies as a kind of strong man, which they sadly are attracted to. And so if the Republican presidential nominating process were going on right now, uh, he would be most likely uh, selected as their nominee because the way Republicans pick their nominees is what's called winner take all. So if you are in a primary in a state and you get one more vote than the second uh, ranking person, you get all the delegates. And so he has this hold on a you know percentage of the party. So in a multi-candidate field, three, four, five, six, and right now, I, I've lost track, but you know, we're at four, five, or six people who have said they're gonna run. Um, all he needs is one more vote to get the delegates, and that seems at this point likely that he will. Who knows you know, what will happen in three or six months. So he will most likely uh, become the Republican nominee again, and he will be defeated by Joe Biden and Kamala Harris. So you mentioned his legal troubles. Uh, do you think that's going to hurt him? Not with his base. Right. And, and you know, this is a phenomenon that is almost hard to uh, wrap your mind around. Um, and he, he understood that. He understood that when he started running uh, the first time back in 2015, that because he was in effect offering himself as the uh, candidate of grievance, of anger, of you know, scapegoating, of finger pointing, uh, that he would have a following uh, that would be extremely loyal to his version of reality. Because he has, from the moment he was elected president, remember when he was um, inaugurated, and we, we all saw it. I mean, I was sitting there on the platform. It was just an extraordinarily depressing moment because usually, not just because you know, you shouldn't have been there, but. <laughs> but because he made absolutely no effort to unite the country after a very tough election. And it's not just, you know, a nice thing to do. It's, it's, it's pretty critically important that when a new president is sworn in, he makes some gesture to people who didn't vote for him. You know, I'm going to be the president of everybody. None of that happened. But what was even more disturbing was the content of his speech, carnage in the street, painting this 
dark, dystopian view of our country, which was unrecognizable to those of us who actually live in the reality-based world and had <laughs> seen you know, the progress that we'd made. Um, and then, of course, once the official pictures were posted, yeah. right? I mean, he went ballistic because it wasn't a very big crowd. And <laughs> I've been to a couple of inaugurations which had big crowds. And And that was the first time we saw that the person who was our president was going to try to convince us that what we were seeing with our own eyes was not real, and what he was instead telling us and his you know, spokespeople were saying was what we were supposed to believe. And it was astonishing to me how seriously they took that. Remember, they worked on this for days. No, 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 the pictures were wrong. No, 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 they were taken from the wrong angle. And it became known as, you know, alternative facts, like there is such a thing. Um, so we, I, I think as bad as many of us feared it would be, it was even worse within literally 24 hours of his uh, inauguration. So I feel like 2016 was this weird uh, you think so? Yeah. <laughs> I was going to say it was like a weird Twilight Zone kind of moment, which I'm sure you uh, experienced more intensely than any of us did. Um, but I think since then there's been this debate about whether the rules still apply. Because it felt in 2016 as if a lot of the conventional rules of politics didn't apply. And then... In 2018, and 2020, and 2022, some of them seemed to apply, some of them seemed to work again, but it wasn't clear which ones would work in which cases. What do you think about that? Is the entire, is all political convention broken since 2016, or do some of the rules still apply? Well, I think we're still trying to figure that out, um, because it, you're, you're right that, uh, his campaign did defy what was expected from uh, a presidential campaign and candidate. There's no doubt about that. And, you know, people couldn't turn away. It was like watching, you know, the train wreck. I mean, you just, you, you didn't want to watch, but you couldn't help it. And we now, of course, know that the media was just totally uh, dumbfounded in one respect because there was no fact-checking him. There was no uh, ability uh, to in any way hold him accountable because he didn't regard the facts or evidence as important. And, you know, as I say, I've been fortunate enough to be in and around uh, a number of presidential campaigns. And usually at a campaign, if your candidate says something flat-out wrong, you try to figure out a way to kind of fix it. Like, well, what he really meant was this, and I'm not sure, but I think if you go back, maybe you misinterpret I mean, you know, it's embarrassing, and, but it's, it's necessary to try to clean it up. Not with him. And, and so I think that the way he was covered was the most um, incredibly unaccountable way that I've ever seen a, a modern presidential candidate covered, because usually there are moments of reckoning. Somebody says something on a debate stage, somebody says something uh, in a uh, speech or in exchange with the press, and they're held accountable because what they said was wrong, not him. And so it was a, not just a difference uh, in you know, a few degrees, but a significant change in what a candidate got away with and how he was treated. And the press, you know, to some extent, particularly broadcast media, uh, found that he was great TV because he was more of a performer. Uh, and he was doing a performance. And remember, people had seen him on TV playing a successful businessman, which, you know, he really wasn't. but. <laughs> That's how he was portrayed. So now he would, they see him on TV 
playing a potential president. And so, hey, you know, he's being held to no standard, but he's entertaining. And we're going to watch because we don't know who he's going to insult and who his target's going to be. And it's entertaining. So I, I think that it was a very uh, difficult uh, environment for, you know, certainly my campaign, for the press, for people to kind of come to grips with. So how do you feel, I mean, I think you're totally right about people living in different realities, and it's something that I think a lot of people in the press are grappling with how to handle. What, how, how, can we, how can we live in a democracy if we are not living in a shared reality? How, how can we get past those two fundamental senses of what is real and what is fake? Well, first you have to start with the premise that half the country doesn't want to get past it. That you have a political party that is counting on driving a distorted reality that advantages their agenda. So when they say things that are patently untrue, they know it, but it's in furtherance of a set of goals that they are pursuing. So you're right that it does great harm to our democracy. I mean, you, you have no shared reality. You're in what's often called a post-truth era, where truth, facts, expertise, none of it matters. What matters is a message that resonates with enough people and certain press outlets that are also in service of that agenda that you try to change the narrative that people accept as being real versus what is actually happening. And look, there's no better example than what happened in the 2020 election and then on January 6th. I mean, think about how repetitive the message has been from Trump and his enablers that he either won the election or he had reason to believe that it wasn't fair, it was, quote, rigged. And despite losing something like 66 court cases where you still have to present evidence, uh, except in the Supreme Court, that's a different story. Um, you know, so, so he loses those cases. There is no evidence. He even gets, thankfully, blocked by Republican secretaries of state and other election officials in states like, you know, Georgia and Arizona, who are appalled at what they're being asked to do. And that was very, you know, very reassuring. So now, of course, those states are changing the rules so that, uh, you know, the hardcore cult members get to make the decisions. Um, but think about it. So, for months, we had a constant stream of untruthful propaganda that the guy who lost hadn't lost. And then we had an attack on our capital. And I mean, still, I find it just extraordinary that people I served with in the Senate for eight years, whom I know, who I believe no better than what I'm hearing them say, are either silent or complicit in the continuation of these lies that Trump is putting out there for his own personal benefit to the detriment of our democracy and the future of our country. So this is what we're up against. So you got a lot of flack back then for calling some Republicans deplorables. How do you think that comment has aged in retrospect? This is like the grandparent question. Um, it's my specialty. Sorry. Look, I... It, yeah, I will, yeah there, there is that argument. I was being too kind. Um, 
it, it, you know, if you actually go back and looked at what I said, I, you know, it was more in sort of sorrow than attack or anger. Because even then, during the campaign, although I had a hard time convincing people of this, I could see the growing grip of this unreality um, on voters. You know, you could see their, you could see their uh, rallies where Trump would say these outrageous things and people would cheer him and, you know, racist, misogynistic, you know, attacking the reporter with disabilities. I mean, things that just made me cringe. And you would see the crowds, you know, lapping it up. And I thought, wow. That, so, so there has to, I was trying to figure out a way to sort of separate the people who'd gone, you know, full cult member um, from people who thought, well, you know, look, he was a successful businessman. I saw that on TV. You know, we need a businessman. We, you know, we could use a businessman. Uh, I always like a change after a two-term president. So let's, you know, let's see what this will bring. I mean, I, I understood the kind of quasi rationalizations that people were um, buying into about why they might support him, as opposed to those people who were, you know, really attracted by the cruelty and the insulting and the, you know, very hateful language that he was using. So I was trying to kind of create some space between what I saw as those two groups and basically said, you know, half of his supporters certainly don't believe that, but, you know, unfortunately there are those who do. Well, you know, now it's like full-fledged uh, open season on truth and decency and civility and, you know, what makes, you know, human activities possible in a big, diverse, pluralistic uh, society like ours and certainly what makes, uh, you know, democratic uh, governance possible. So, you know, look, it might not have been the most politic thing, although, frankly, he said so many more things that were worse. Um, <laughs> and I felt like, oh, okay, hang me out to dry for saying that about, you know, some of his supporters. In the meantime, holy moly, they want to send me to jail. Um, <laughs> the whole thing was bizarre from, you know, so many different perspectives. But I, th I th actually think that, um, that the people who really buy into his message and his, you know, persona are not the ones any longer that bother me that much. It's the people who know better and go along with it and are complicit with it. So on that note, do you still believe in bipartisanship? I mean, who are Democrats? Absolutely. Yeah. And yeah, but, but look, Charlotte, we have some great examples. You know, because we are so obsessed, and understandably so, sadly, with the personality of Trump, I mean, he still dominates the American psyche, and he should be exiled from the American psyche because <laughs> it's unhealthy. People either don't know because it never breaks through to them, or they discount the extraordinary legislation that Joe Biden got passed during his first two years as president. So, and, you know, it wasn't just the American Rescue Plan coming out of COVID and trying to get us to uh, the end, you know, the ending of, of that pandemic. Um, it was also, you know, the infrastructure bill. I mean, Donald Trump must have said infrastructure a thousand times and never presented a bill. Joe Biden said it maybe 10 times and presented a bill and got it passed. And we are now engaged in a very important rebuilding process in our country and putting, you know, hundreds of thousands of, of people to work. And then along comes the CHIPS bill to try to reinstate advanced manufacturing in America in competition with China, particularly. Again, bipartisan, and announcements are being made of, you know, $100 million plants north of Syracuse, New York, plants in Arizona, different places around the country that are going to be competitive. Um, and, you know, the Inflation Reduction Act wasn't as bipartisan, but 
it's fascinating when projects are being announced, Republicans who didn't vote for it show up and take credit. So that's kind of a form of bipartisanship. So, um, yeah, I, I, still, I still believe in a place called bipartisanship. And I think it is a, you know, it is an important, um, an important goal, but it can't be a goal that hurts America. Like right now, you're seeing this very dangerous debt limit negotiation where, you know, Speaker Kevin McCarthy is holding our country hostage to try to literally change the budget after it's already been uh, written. And Biden is saying, no, I'm not going to agree with that. Let's see if we can come up with something that's more, uh, you know, reasonable. So he's, Biden is willing to invest in it, but not to the point, I believe, from what I'm hearing, uh, that would hurt us, uh, which is important. So it's, it's a goal. It, it can't be at the cost of important principles and values, um, but it is something that you know, responsible leaders in a democracy do try to continue to pursue because you want to have some common ground with people. Now, it's easier when you've got people who also want to meet you part way, and we'll see what happens on this debt limit, whether that's, you know, even possible. So I'm going to bring in an audience question from Brianna, who says this. Like you, I was raised in a Republican household. How did you pave your own political identity apart from your family's? And how did or do you navigate difficult conversations where you might not see eye to eye? Well, I, I did, well, first let me say that my father's Republican Party has nothing to do with what we're seeing today. Um, and, so yes, it, you know, I grew up in Park Ridge, and we used to say that, uh, you know, in 1964, 80% of the people in Park Ridge voted for Barry Goldwater, and the other 20% thought he was too liberal. Um, so <laughs> that's just a, you know, kind of uh, commentary. Um, but so yes, my father was a small businessman. He was a traditional. Republican, but he also believed in funding schools and parks and the, you know, national defense because he'd been in the Navy. He he actually thought that you know Medicare and and Medicaid were good ideas to go along with Social Security. He was always worried about how much money would be spent, but he wasn't against the principles of you know trying to find ways to help lift people up and give them um, more of an opportunity. My mother was always canceling his vote anyway. Um, <laughs> so, you know, I don't think my father ever voted for a Democrat until he voted for my husband. Um, <laughs> and I know for a fact my mother did. So I, I grew up, you know, in a house that was an early precursor of the gender gap in politics. Um, and, and so it, it, we, we would have very, uh, you know, spirited debates at the dinner table, which I thought were great because I would argue with my father about politics and my mother would, you know, chime in, often disagreeing with my father, and then we'd, you know, go at it some more. So I, I grew up believing that it was important to be informed, to know what was happening in the world, and to, you know, really develop your own opinions. And that's what eventually, you know, I was able to do uh, as I got to college. So uh, it, it was a process like so many people go through. And uh, I always appreciated the importance that my father, you know, put on being uh, a well-informed citizen and in voting in every election. He never missed a vote in an election. So, you know, those were important messages that I picked up on. So, enough about the Republicans. <laughs> Let's talk about the Democrats. Um, I covered the surge of, of political engagement following 2016, where hundreds, even thousands of women, first-timers who had never been involved in politics before, stepped up and ran for office, sometimes uh, offices as big as the House of Representatives, other times offices more similar to what Joanne ran for. 
Um, what did you make of that? And what advice would you give to those women? Well, I was thrilled. You know, I was thrilled by uh, the Women's March the day after the inauguration. Um, and, you know, a lot of it was motivated in kind of a, a, a reaction against what had happened in the election and a, and a disbelief at the outcome uh, and a feeling that, you know, we all needed to have done more to prevent, uh, you know, the uh, victory uh, in the Electoral College of uh, Donald Trump. So I felt very connected to and part of the uh, uh, extraordinary outpouring of, of feeling and commitment. And so I wanted to support what I saw happening, and I started a group in uh, 2017 called Onward Together to fund, thank you, to, to fund organizations that were recruiting young people, recruiting people of color, recruiting people to run at all levels. Because one of the things that Democrats hadn't focused on was exactly what your grandmother had done, what Joanne had done, uh, you know, by, you know, running in Cook County, run, you know, take, taking the offer that Mayor Daley, you know, made to her to run for the sanitation uh, district position. These are really important jobs, and they have a lot to do with, you know, the quality of life in every one of our communities. And so we wanted to encourage people to run at the local level, state level, and yes, of course, at the federal level. So we ended up supporting about 17 groups that were doing really great work uh, in uh, both recruiting candidates, training them, mentoring them, recruiting the uh, potential campaign staffs because you need a, a good cadre of staffs. Also working on issue uh, uh, matters that uh, were important to us and we started a PAC to um, fund uh, a lot of these uh, candidates. And you know, we, I felt very strongly uh, that we had to compete more at every level of politics. I mean, there were too many offices uh, in too many parts of our country where no Democrat ever ran because nobody got out there and did the work. And sometimes, you know, you have to run once or twice or you have to lay the groundwork for somebody else to come and run uh, before you can uh, be elected. So, you know, since uh, 2017, we've, you know, raised about $63 million for organizations and candidates. And I feel, and, and we have a really high win rate. We have, for the people we gave uh, direct contributions to, we have about a two-thirds, you know, win rate because we try to identify people, and not, not always the obvious people, but people who, you know, really look like they have something to say, like Lauren Underwood here in Illinois, right? I mean, truly one of the most effective um, members of Congress, and she's only been there, what, two terms? I mean, it's quite remarkable. Uh, so we, we want to really zero in on people who are going to do the work and, and, and really produce results that can then get them reelected and they can move up the ranks uh, within uh, the House or whatever other uh, position they're in. But it's also, I think, critically important to say that you know, the energy that I saw from particularly women and uh, young people um, has not abated. You know, I, I was doing an interview, um, I think, uh, with the Financial Times over the weekend at an event they were hosting. And, you know, the interviewer was saying, well, you know, young people are not involved in politics. I said, wait a minute, I don't agree with the premise of your question anymore. Yeah, not true. Because it's not true anymore. I mean, starting in 2018 and then in 2020, the percentage of young people, not just running for office, but actually turning out and voting, uh, has been uh, really significant. So I think if we can keep this energy going, um, we, we have a, a very good prospect for 2024. So on that note, on the question of age, that there's a, there is a little bit of a, a disconnect in the Democratic Party right now because there's all this energy, as you've said, coming from these younger generations of voters who are, who are overwhelmingly appalled by Trump and Trumpism. And also, we have a Democratic Party that is very, very old. Um, 
why, can we just have a little bit of a candid conversation about age? Why do smart people often make sort of foolish retirement choices? <laughs> I'm, I'm thinking specifically, you know, your husband appointed Justice Ginsburg, Ginsburg to the Supreme Court. She didn't retire until it was a little too late. You served in the Senate with, Senate with Senator Feinstein, who's now almost 90. Why are so many Democrats staying in office for this long? You know, I have a very negative response to that question. Because, Sorry. And, and, it, and in part, it's because if you look at um, Justice Ginsburg, whom I got to know well, um, she was a survivor. She was as energetic um, as, and, as she'd ever been. I mean, I, I was with her, you know, shortly before she did pass away, and she was as sharp and focused as she could be. And I think she made a judgment that a lot of men in other situations have made, that she still could do the job, she was up to the job, and she had said she was going to uh, retire if I'd been elected, because she wanted me to choose her successor. And when I wasn't elected, she was, you know, she had a tough choice to make. And so I think she deserves a lot of respect, because she certainly um, was a very, you know, a, a very thoughtful person. These, 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 these uh, concerns did not escape her. And, let me say a word about my, my friend and, and longtime colleague, Dianne Feinstein. First of all, she has suffered greatly from the bout of shingles and encephalitis that she uh, endured. Here is the dilemma for her, because, you know, she got reelected. The, the people of California voted for her again, not very long ago. And so that was the voters' decision to vote for her. Uh, and she has been a remarkable and very effective um, leader, both as mayor of San Francisco and as senator. But now, here's the dilemma. The Republicans will not agree to add someone else to the Judiciary Committee if she retires. I want you to think about how crummy that is. So I don't know what's in her heart about whether she really would or wouldn't, but right now she can't. Because if we're going to get judges confirmed, which is one of the most important continuing uh, obligations that we have, then we cannot afford to have her seat vacant. And Chuck Grassley from Iowa is 89 also. And, you know, nobody is saying, you're too mean to be here any longer. Um, so, again, with Diane, I don't know, I mean, if the Republicans were to say and do the decent thing, which was, yeah, you know, this woman was gravely ill. She had just lost her husband to cancer when this happened, uh, shortly after. Of course we will let you fill the position if she retires, but they won't say that. So what, are, I mean, what are, what are we supposed to do? I, I, I mean, all these people pushing her to retire, Fine, we get no more judges. I don't think that's a good trade-off. But I'm asking a broader question, because you're, you're absolutely right about the specific situation. But they're always specific. Right. I do not believe in broad questions about age. There are smart, effective older people, smart, effective younger people, and not so much for either. So I, you know, it's like term limits. If you don't want to vote for somebody, don't vote for them. But don't impose some kind of artificial, you know, check on the voters. So, no, I just, I don't buy this whole debate. And frankly, a lot of the people pushing it, I don't understand what their real agenda is, because part of it is a, is a bank shot 
against Joe Biden. And I think Joe Biden has done a very good job in the two years he's been president. So, I, look, I mean, do we all wish we were younger? Well, yeah, from time to time. Um, but I've been around, I've been around, you know, President Biden. I've had conversations with him about important issues. And I've always had a very full and very, uh, you know, substantive conversation with him. Um, so, I, I, you know, look, as he says, and I think this is a very fair point, don't judge him against the almighty, judge him against the alternative. <laughs> and, you know, I think, you know, Donald Trump, his age, he's been like this since he was a child, and so, <laughs> By, you know, by any fair measure, he should have never been allowed to run for president. Bullies should not run for president, right? So I want to talk about Dobbs for a second. Um, do you think, you know, this is obviously such a watershed moment for American women. Do you think the Supreme Court is in a legitimacy crisis right now? Well, look, I, I think... I think the Supreme Court is doing exactly what the people who chose them to be on the court want them to do. And this has been a long-term project uh, run through something called the Federalist Society, where young lawyers and uh, young judges have been identified as being uh, in line with the ideological partisan viewpoints that those picking them are pursuing. And so I think that the um, court, very sadly, reflects uh, a concerted effort that was not only aimed at creating the court we have, but remember, stopped Barack Obama from getting even a vote in committee after Scalia dropped dead in the summer before an election. And they all claimed, oh no, it's too close to an election. What baloney was that? And they would not give the President of the United States the right, as he has under the Constitution, to fill that vacancy. But then, shortly before the 2020 election, they installed a Supreme Court justice of their choice. So the process has been, you know, moving toward questionable legitimacy for some time. The decisions that are being made are results-oriented in line with what these justices are expected to deliver. And the Dobbs decision itself is a poorly written, poorly reasoned, anti-historical, um, you know, opinion. That it, 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 it is not connected to precedent. It is absolutely in defiance of how all those justices testified when they were up for confirmation. Oh, Roe v. Wade is settled law. Yes, well, yes it is. I mean, this has been a game from the beginning. This, this is what they have been aiming to do. So is it just now illegitimate? The whole process has been illegitimate, the way that they have pursued it and achieved their goals. And now they are rendering you know, decisions to turn the clock back on everything from voting rights to the interpretation of the Second Amendment uh, to uh, the Dobbs decision. And sadly, I think there's you know, more uh, partisan, ideological, uh, driven decisions to come. So what do you think is going to be the long-term impact of this, of the Dobbs decision? Well, I think the long-term impact is, is uh, several, uh, several things. And I, I really, you know, wish I didn't have to say this, but women will die because of this decision. They will be denied health care. I mean, the stories we're hearing now where women are being turned away who are miscarrying or whose, uh, you know, pregnancy is terribly at risk, but there is still a heartbeat, even though 
there is not a brain wave, or even though the prediction is that a baby would die shortly after delivery, women are being told to go wait in their cars in the parking lot until they're really sick before they're taken care of. Or they're being told that, yes, you know, you're going to have to carry uh, the baby to term even though it's already, uh, you know, dead. I mean, things that are just so horrible and that nobody should be subjected to by the decisions of you know, legislators in states and governors in states. And it's also, I think, reminiscent of what happened in Ireland. Ireland had the most restrictive abortion laws in uh, Europe, and a, a woman, a doctor, um, who was suffering a, a miscarriage and severe distress, went into a hospital and needed uh, a, an a operation uh, that she, it was a wanted baby. Obviously, it was a tragic situation. She needed medical intervention. But the heartbeat was still beating. And she was told that uh, she wasn't eligible yet. And she got sepsis, and she died. And that led to the most extraordinary outpouring by the Irish people against an abortion law that led to the deaths of women, that they overturned the whole law in a referendum. And what we're seeing in the United States right now is when voters, not legislators, you know, not justices, but voters get to exercise their common sense, they look for what is reasonable. And they vote against people who want to restrict abortion, no exceptions, you know, no opportunity for the kind of medical care that you might need because doctors are too afraid of going to jail. And so, honestly, I think it will continue to be a voting issue, and I certainly hope it is a voting issue, because the only way we're going to reverse any of this is by voting out the people who want to restrict our rights and turn back the clock. So you were 26 at the time of Roe v. Wade. And so you remember well what it was like before. Can you tell us what you remember about bef before abortion was legalized? You know, it, it was a very fraught time. And it was, you know, something that people, you know, didn't uh, talk about a lot. But everybody knew that there was a, uh, you know, a, a very serious uh, problem when you know, women were denied uh, reproductive choice. And, you know, the 1973 decision post-dated some states that had much more um, open uh, uh, abortion laws. And so, depending, again, where you lived, it was or wasn't uh, a significant uh, challenge. Uh, but it was a serious, you know, it was a serious threat to a lot of uh, women's, uh, you know, health and well-being. And, and so what, you know, people forget, Roe was not a decision which said, you know, all bets are off, anything goes. It was a decision based on each trimester. It was a decision that had, at the time, as best as it could, a connection with what was known uh, med medically. So for most people, it was a recognition that, you know, these are complicated, difficult decisions that are hard to make and that people should make, you know, on their own with their doctor, with what their faith is, and nobody's going to order you what to do. You're going to make the best decision for you, whatever that might be. And that seemed to be a very uh, kind of common sense approach. But it provided, you know, remember, before 1973, there wasn't this huge anti-abortion movement that we now have seen develop. And in fact, those on the, on the right who were either motivated because of 
uh, financial considerations, they wanted, you know, low taxes, no regulation, or maybe on race because they disagreed with the 64 Civil Rights Act or the 65 Voting Rights Act or the 68 Fair Housing Act, what, or, you know, they were kind of listening to the dog whistle of Nixon's, you know, silent majority. They were very clever in figuring out that they could forge a coalition with people who didn't approve of the Roe v. Wade uh, decision and turn it into uh, a real, you know, motivator for uh, Republican politics. So, like so much else, you know, this was a very uh, well thought out, calculated uh, decision, and uh, we're now, you know, living with the results. So, I want to broaden out a little bit. There, um, I want to talk to you about ambition and happiness, because I think a lot of people, particularly women my age, particularly since the pandemic, are kind of rethinking their relationship to ambition. Um, you see it in the decline of the girl boss, you see it in a sort of critique of this hustle culture, um, and a lot of women in particular, I think, are realizing that accomplishment and happiness are not necessarily the same thing. Um, and you're somebody who spent your whole life working hard, and you are, for a lot of people, kind of a symbol of women's ambition. So what do you think? Do you think accomplishment and happiness necessarily go together? Well, personally, I do. Um, yeah. I, I think it, but <clears throat> that doesn't mean that everybody defines it in the same way. I mean, what does ambition mean to you versus your friend, your neighbor, your sister, your mother, whoever? And what does accomplishment mean? I think there may be an almost liberating and empowering um, opportunity here where people can rethink what ambition and accomplishment mean for them. And I have spent my entire adult life arguing that women should make whatever the responsible choices that are best for them will be. And I've now lived long enough that I know that the choice you make in your 20s may not be the choice you make in your 40s or the choice you make in your 60s. And so what we want is to create an environment in which women are able to define those terms, ab ambition and accomplishment, based on their own sense of purpose and fulfillment and happiness. And so, I, again, I think it's really dangerous to make broad-based statements because we're all so different, and we also have different experiences. You know, when you're a young woman, single, no family, you have a different sense of, you know, your timing and what you can expect from your life than, you know, if you become a wife, you become a mother, you become, you know, a, a person who has other responsibilities that will certainly affect how you feel about uh, ambition, accomplishment, uh, and how you define your happiness. I think we're living in a, in a time of searching, and in part COVID accelerated that because, you know, everybody had so much time alone. People were, you know, often cut off from their social uh, networks, maybe not, you know, even working, but if working still, working maybe remotely. Um, and so there was a lot of rethinking going on, and I think that's healthy. As long as we don't fall into another trap, which is, oh, no, now, you know, nobody could be ambitious and accomplished and be happy. Well, I'm here to tell you, yes, you can. You can be <laughs> ambitious and accomplished and happy, um, however you define uh, any of that. And so I, I just, I don't, I, I really reject the, you know, the boxes we try to put ourselves and others in. And I think it's also a problem if women, we start now judging each other on even different standards. Um, oh, well, she's still ambitious in the outside world. She can't be happy. Well, you don't know that. You have no idea. And so worry about your own life. And. Uh, <laughs> Make it as happy as you can make it for yourself. So you once said something that I thought was so interesting. Um, 
uh, where, where you said that uh, if this was an, in an interview in the aftermath of 2016 where you said that women still faced a, pernis a, a pernicious double standard uh, that was aided and abetted by the idea of perfectionism. So how, how do we get at that? How, how, can, how can we dismantle that type of perfectionism that so many women feel compared to? You know, um, that's a really good question because uh, I don't know what it is about moving from sort of girlhood to adolescence, but we now have a lot of research that little girls are just so brave and so willing to stand up and speak out and try things and fail and try again. I mean, how many cartwheels did you have to do before you could actually do one, you know? It's just, there's a, there's a sense of adventure and curiosity and risk taking. And then puberty hits and girls become more self-conscious and more, um, you know, worried about how they're being perceived and whether they're being, you know, liked. And that's been true for the, you know, all of history, I think. But now we throw in the added element of social media. And the addiction to social media and the false lives that social media presents have been particularly damaging to girls. You know, the increase in anxiety and depression and eating disorders because we were talking earlier about, you know, a, a political false reality. Well, social media is a false reality, and, and yet it's so omnipresent, and it controls so much of the time and the headspace of young people. And I, I read a fascinating study which showed that, you know, boys are also affected, but boys not so much, in part because boys spend more time on uh, screens playing games, while girls are on screens scrolling and comparing themselves and seeing people who are filtered up in every way looking, you know, so much more glamorous or finding out they weren't invited to a party. And so the agency of gaming has somehow protected boys a little bit more than the social media uh, unreality um, that girls engage in has. So I, I, you know, I think that the perfectionism comes from comparing yourself to other people. And it was hard enough when you were living, you know, in a real world where the kids you went to school with were the kids you knew, not people who are disembodied faces and bodies from who knows where that you're now comparing yourself to. And and, and that creeping insecurity, like I'm not thin enough, I'm not pretty enough, I'm not smart enough, I'm not this enough, I'm not that enough, all of a sudden begins to eat away at the confidence and the, you know, the sense of self. And, you know, most young people get through it, but some are particularly damaged by it. So the perfectionism, which I think has been kind of a ongoing challenge for um, girls and women um, has just seemed to me to be made more intense and more destructive because of social media. So one of the things that has continued to be, that has always really been true about some of the, the coverage of you throughout your political career, which has sometimes been very unfair, um, is that uh, oftentimes people feel as if they are not getting to know the real you. And it's always reminded me of this John Updike quote where he says, celebrity is the mask that eats the face. And so I'm wondering, how, how are you thinking about that these days? Are you, are you feeling like you're able to be more yourself now? Do you feel like you've been yourself the whole time and people have been unwilling to see it? You know, what, where are, what are you thinking about that now? I, I think I've been the same person my entire life. And I think I've been pretty, you know, I think I've been pretty consistent, but 
I think that, I think several things. One, uh, we alluded earlier to the question of the double standard. I mean, when you are at a very high level of visibility, I often say you're like a Rorschach test. People see in you what reflects back to them about something that is of concern to them, whether it's really embedded in you or just you know, part of what someone is uh, possibly uh, seeking for themselves. And I think that the, the so-called you know, double standard, which is alive and well, um, is a, you know, is a, is a way of trying to pigeonhole women in the public arena so that they're understandable to, to not just individuals but groups. And so if you, you know, when I, when I started wearing pantsuits, <laughs> you know, it was, for a, it, it was for a very practical reason. It was because, as first lady, when I used to wear a lot more skirts in those days, um, I had these bizarre experiences. Like, I was in Brazil as first lady. I was at the home of the president in Brasilia. I was meeting with the president's wife. We were sitting on couches. I had on a, you know, like a suit, a, a, a jacket and a skirt and, you know, stockings when I used to wear stockings. And, uh, you know, so I was sitting there on the couch and the press came in for a photo spray. And, you know, a lot of the, the camera guys were lying on the floor and they were shooting up, the worst thing. <laughs> so, you know, we finished our trip to Brazil. It was a state visit. Um, and. Uh, I go back to the White House and, you know, a few days later, there are billboards all over Brazil, or at least Rio and Sao Paulo, with me sitting there and sort of it's suggestively looking like up my skirt and it's selling lingerie. <laughs> so now that was pretty bizarre, right? And so then I had, Another experience shortly after that, uh, which was I was walking up a staircase at an event and the photographers are all down below shooting up. And I'm thinking like, what is going on here? Or getting out of a car and, you know, stuff like that. And finally I thought, this is crazy. So, you know, I started wearing lots of pants because I sit on stages and things like that. And, and so, you know, all of a sudden people started saying, first lady should not wear pants. No first lady should wear pants. That is wrong. And so now, all of a sudden, I had all these people who were upset with me because I was wearing pants. And you, you just cannot pay attention to that. I mean, part of, the, part of it is, you know, it, there's just too much other important stuff to worry about. And I just, you know, I cannot, I cannot figure out half of what people think about me because, <laughs> It's so weird. And now, and now with all the stuff online, you know, occasionally I will encounter, you know, it's like, remember that ridiculous thing, Pizzagate? Remember Pizzagate? I mean, out of nowhere, made up crazy stuff. And you're sitting there thinking like, wow, this is weird. And what are you gonna do about it? Well, not much you can do about it. So honestly, Charlotte, my, I, I, just, I just live my life, you know? And that's all I can do. So I want to end on uh, going back to something you said just a couple minutes ago about we were talking about rethinking during the pandemic. I want to know about your own personal rethinking. Was there anything you rethought about your life? Was there anything, you know, and, and um, you know, my final question, which is what I'm, I think a lot of people are curious about is, um, you've said that since the, since the 2016 election, people come up to you and say, you know, are you okay? Um, and it seems like you're totally okay. <laughs> um, but I, but it, 
but I'm, I'm curious if you have a sense of the ingredients for happiness for you. What are the ingredients for happiness for you? Well, you know, I, I like feeling that I'm helping people. That makes me very happy. I like finding ways to solve problems that I think are, um, you know, challenging. And if we can figure out solutions, people's lives will be better. I have a, you know, I have a very simple calculation. Is something that I'm trying to do going to help people or not? Is it going to make people better off when I finish than when I started? And it's something that gets me up in the morning. I'm very motivated by that. You know, um, I, I learned um, just in the last few days that uh, the Trump administration investigated the Clinton Foundation for four years. And of course found nothing because there's nothing to find. But it was almost like since they had a foundation that was shut down by the Attorney General of the State of New York because it cheated people, that they had to, you know, project that, you know, what Bill and I were doing, there had to be something, you know, wrong about it because they're so dishonest and crooked and corrupt that the rest of us should be. And it's just not true. And so they tried, they failed. And we just get up every day and try to figure out how we're going to help people. And it is really the source of what gets me going and keeps me going. And I'll give you a couple of quick examples. So, you know, we brought back something called the Clinton Global Initiative um, in September because we had stopped it in, in 2016. It was thrilling, thrilling to have people, you know, in the room making commitments to solve problems, whether it was a commitment that a, a young doctor was making to use already existing drugs to help solve problems other than the ones that the drugs were prescribed for, and he's making progress on it, and we've been helping him. Or it was people who were you know, trying to figure out what to do about maternal mortality, which is a disgrace in the United States. We have the highest maternal mortality rate in the advanced uh, world or whether it was working with a group of amazing, you know, poor women in India to deal with the horrible effects of heat and climate change and how we can help them, you know, come up with some solutions. You know, I, I, I am old fashioned in that, you know, I had, a, I had a wonderful family, I had a wonderful upbringing, I had a really great public school education, I went to a, a woman's college, I went to law school. I was given so many advantages uh, that I am very grateful for, but also very conscious of. And I just always have felt like it's important to try to keep giving back. But I also find it really incredibly rewarding. And I want to sort of end with a story that I read when I was just like a little kid. And my father used to read Reader's Digest. Does anybody remember Reader's Digest? Okay. If you're below a certain age, you don't. But <laughs> my father read them. They were stacked up in our house. I would read them. And I was probably like 10 years old. And I read this um, story about um, a famous psychiatrist. And his name was Menninger. And I think he was in Kansas. And he was writing about how he was called one day by a very rich man and said that he had to come see Dr. Menninger right away. And so Dr. Menninger said, well, all right, and made an appointment, and this very rich man flew from wherever he was uh, to see Dr. Menninger. And he goes in and he says to Dr. Menninger, I am more successful than I ever thought possible. I'm richer than I know what to do with. Why am I so unhappy? And Dr. Menninger said, I'm going to write you a prescription, and I'm going to put it in this envelope, and I want you to take it home, and I don't want you to open it until you are in your house. Oh, so this man's very excited because he's going to get the answer to why, despite all of his accomplishments, he's unhappy. And uh, so he goes home, he goes in his house, and he can't wait. He runs into his study, and he sits at his desk, and he opens it up, and the note says, Go change your clothes, put on some work clothes, and go find somebody to help. 
And, you know, I was like 10 years old, and I read that, and, you know, that's what my church told me, that's what my family told me. It just, it's always been, despite whatever happens to me, I've always been motivated in politics, I've always been motivated in government by what I could do, and I've said before, I said I am not a natural politician like Bill Clinton or Barack Obama, but I get up every day and try to figure out what I'm going to do to help somebody. And so as long as I have breath to breathe, that's what I'm going to do, and it makes me happy. Secretary Clinton, thank you so much for being here today with us. Thank you. Thank you, everybody. Thank you.